have a really difficult panel uh, because uh, say a lot of uh, banalities <laughs> uh, because the, the word network is uh, a buzzword, of course. Um, so we will try to uh, go further on, on our discussion. Uh, in a way, I think uh, all of us are uh, somehow part of uh, some kind of network. So on the stage, we will have some representants of uh, some kind of, um, I don't know if we could say institutional, but maybe uh, formed, yeah, okay, <laughs> formed um, networks. But I, I think you are as well uh, part of the network and we will think and we will talk about how all of us, we could be protagonists of the society. Uh, so it's why we have here a supplementary chair, an empty chair for, for you. So at any time, any of you want to take part and join the conversation, you are more than invited and welcome to join us. And so you, ca you could come and uh, make your uh, question and then uh, keep the place for another one. So I am introducing now the, the panelists. So I will start with Maya Johansson. Uh, she is part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and uh, this foundation is developing a network of cities promoting a circular economy. Please. Welcome. I don't know, maybe. So we will continue, maybe. We will continue with uh, Olivia Armenta. Uh, uh, she is from uh, C14. Uh, it's a network of mega cities addressing climate changes. Welcome. Uh, Thomas Diaz, you already have the opportunity to uh, hear him. Thomas is hiding. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, Thomas. And um, we have uh, Samanda Van Hen Boss. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation, and uh, she's, uh, she has the experience previously working on uh, Sharing Cities project, but now she's starting a new project uh, called Art of Sharing, actually it's, uh, uh, teaching children in terms of uh, sharing process, uh, uh, using digital tools, and uh, we will discover more about it. So I will use the chair as well. <laughs> So um, I think the, the better way to start is just to, to, to know more about your, uh, your project. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Olivia. In a few words, I don't know if you could introduce. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Olivia Armenta, and I work with 100 Resilient Cities, and it's an initiative um, uh, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. So what we're doing is we're working in a hundred cities in uh, in many continents, so in Africa, Asia, um, North America, and Latin America, and I mostly work with the cities in Latin America. And so the idea is that with these hundred cities, uh, we're trying to understand, um, we're trying to build resilience at the urban level and build resilience strategies within those cities. So a lot of the uh, sharing and learning amongst these 100 cities is, is important uh, sharing part of the network. OK, thanks. Uh, Maya? Yes. Uh, my name is Maya Johannesson, and I'm uh, from the Elmagatha Foundation. Uh, the foundation is a think tank that works solely to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. Um, and we do that by working across five areas, so inside analysis, creating the evidence base for the circular economy, uh, education, so working with uh, formal and informal education programs, uh, business and government, which is very much focusing on, on network and um, collaboration, and then systemic initiative, where we bring together stakeholders across uh, value chains for specific material flows. Um, in my daily work, I work with the government and policy and focusing on um, how to uh, change, change the rules of the market together with governments. Thanks. Uh, Samantha? Um, so the Art of Sharing um, is an action-oriented urban lab in Amsterdam we, we recently launched. 
So the past two years, I've had the opportunity to uh, be working at ShareNL, which is a Dutch uh, network um, and knowledge platform in the Netherlands for the sharing economy. And there I've been working a lot with different stakeholders on strategy and vision for cities. Um, and I think for now it was time to do something more active oriented. Um, because a vision and a strategy uh, for me is one thing and I would like to involve a bigger group in the sharing economy because it's still for a happy few if, if you look at um, uh, users and participants in the sharing economy and I would like to um, challenge ourselves. Uh, we're developing new tools and programs uh, such as an educational program to really start also from the seeds of our society, the children and to, um, yeah, to reach them already, yeah. Thanks. So, Thomas, we already heard from you. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> um, I think what is interesting now is also this situation, uh, people coming from different uh, uh, um, structures and uh, different stakeholders and working at different level for uh, cities and society. So, our subject is networks. Uh, it's true that networks are really changing the, our society. So I want to uh, introduce uh, these thoughts about networks. What do you think uh, networks are promoting a contra power or a complementary power? What do, what do you think? Maybe you could answer uh, from your perspective. Uh, your structure, your project, and then in general, what do you think about these uh, two? You want to start, maybe? I, I no? spoke a lot, so I will. I, will. Um, I suppose I would view them in, in terms of both uh, counter power and complementary power. I mean, I think that the what I'm finding um, in my work is that um, we are really banking on municipal governments and mayor's offices to make change. And I think that we are seeing that. I mean, it's, I think that what we're seeing in the US, for example, in terms of climate change and uh, you know, different stances that mayors are taking, but I think just in uh, different contexts like Latin America, where you have um, very creative ideas happening at the project level and how to, how to um, engage the city and how to create your city. And I think that the, this is informing um, counter power in terms of uh, what that means in terms of investments at the central government level or the federal level. And so I think we're starting to see that. And I think um, the other parameter I'd say in a larger sense is that you are, one is changing the conditions for changing the system. So by creating a network of 100 cities, we are also seeing the potential for good processes in design and infrastructure. and human-centered development or taking into account climate change or, or other um, risks in terms of, uh, you know, we're very interested in, in shocks and stresses. So um, what that means for inequality and earthquakes and uh, flooding, et cetera. And so how do you make better design? So I think that in those processes, you're seeing how you can inform uh, investments at the central government level, and therefore I would see it more as a as counter power. And then I'd say complementary just because, I mean, ultimately we are working with government, so we are also banking on the fact that governments work to some extent um, and are able to implement these programs. Um, yeah, so I would say, so with, with the CE100, which is this uh, multi-stakeholder platform where we bring together both uh, national governments, local governments, corporates, uh, SMEs and academics, there, there we very much focus on collaboration and implementation and showing best practice. Um, that in itself, uh, ideally, will uh, creating a, a like bottom-up uh, pressure on the system to, for for that to change. But we also work directly with with um, with people in power to to also change their practices. So I would say, yeah, also, like you said, both both counter and, and complementary. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. And what I see with the project we're doing now, um, in the beginning when we wanted to introduce the art of sharing um, as an educational program, we had to deal with the educational system in place. So uh, looking at a very complex structure, um, what we were doing also uh, started to feel very much as a contra power because you're constantly trying to 
change uh, something and 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 yeah I, you're dealing with a complex bureaucratic system so once we've decided actually to do it as an extra curricular program um, we could see it as complementary and I see I see this in a more general uh, view as well so I think we're all changing the system from outside in and yeah so I agree yeah, well, uh, there's one thing we were discussing a little bit before and about the, the networks, no? and, I, and I think that as, you know, it's, it, we talk about networks as something new, but okay, you know, the United Nations was, fun, it was a network, or I think I'd say it was because fundamentally lost its power somehow during the last uh, 20 years or so, but um, I think that we have seen only like a really tiny potential of the current uh, networks, uh, Especially with the use of uh, you know digital platforms, no, and and being able to enable the infrastructure for those networks to exchange value in a more fluid way, I think that's where we probably will see how things start to probably create that effect, no. I think that we are in like in a in a in a massive wicked problem in which there is like a we are thinking about a world, and within these networks probably we do more or less similar work, I would say. But at the same time, we have very static and very rigid structures and that are holding stuff where we want to share it and, and circulate it. No? So um, I think that's, I don't know if we are challenging it, but I think that, you, and I think that shouldn't be the role of the networks. I think it should be probably enabling a new way of exchanging value and ex you know, basically making possible things that are not possible with, uh, with the, you know, the kind of isolated silos of, of, of cities or states working. Thanks. Um, I'm thinking about how networks could change the, the represent representativity. <laughs> I mean, how the legitimacy of uh, any network in terms of um, the people involved and the, the capacity to uh, have impact on, on the society. For instance, you know, this uh, situation in the US where you, you could have s different cities fighting a national uh, policy. Uh, what is the legitimacy of this network and where they found uh, the representativity of their, themselves? I'm clear about it. You mean, I think uh, the, the subject is now as we are thinking that we could uh, we could be a different kind of citizens actually communities and, and networks we already had in the past uh, now maybe f with the digital sphere we could uh, go further uh, but uh, we could ask ourselves how uh, we understand each of us as, as a citizens involved in different networks uh, even if it's for a company or public administration etc what is our power real power and who is behind us and why uh, we could act with the legitimacy. I don't know if I'm clear. Uh... Yeah, but I think that you're talking about legit legitimacy as if votes legitimate governments to do stuff, and then if they, there's a the decision making of that is kind of, you know, basically stated by that. No, like a legitimacy, I would challenge like if there is any legitimacy as today in the political powers, no, and also for even the, if the democratic model gives legitimacy to do whatever. Uh, on the other hand, you know what you were saying, that I think that we are trapped within networks. Um, and the networks that, you know, that give us what we wear, they bring us the technology to our houses, that build the city, they are networks. So the, the current economical you know, model works on networks, no? like a, a global network of supply chains, access to resources, so we are trapped when you got into an airplane, you are you are flying in a network of. Uh, Alastair was putting that example, no, of, or a network of manufacturers and development and research. So you are we are trapped in networks somehow. So, I, I, you know, I think that this I would challenge the idea of of if being part of a network is just you know being in a Facebook group or participating in a in the budget in your. Uh, yeah, you mean there is a sort of naivete of a sort na of naivete in French? There is this kind of 
Naive. You can, it's a, yeah, it's a bit naive, I would say. Naive. So, I don't know, do you have some reaction about that or? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, in one way, um, we see that uh, there's this whole world out there where everybody's connected and we're crossing uh, territorial borders as we haven't ever done before, connecting to people to even from a different continent and exchanging knowledge or whatever. Um, but at the same time, uh, I agree, we are trapped in, in, in networks because what you see is that urban uh, citizens are connecting to other urban citizens around the world and cities are starting to look like each other, or citizens are starting to look more and more like each other. And yeah, so we, we are crossing these territorial borders in a way, but on a local level, there's a lot of social borders we're not crossing because we are trapped in those networks. Because when we are talking about digital networks, then if you look at the participation level, um, there's a whole group not active. Um, so in a sense, yes, networks are opening up uh, a lot, but on the other hand, um, are divi are, is it, it's dividing us as well in, in, in groups of uh, different people and, and reinforcing social structures as they are now. So I think there's uh, still a lot we could tackle there. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking as well that uh, during the uh, Wisher Fest, uh, we talked a lot about civic tech. And I felt that sometimes we uh, use new technologies to just uh, get in theoretically, uh, people more involved, but we are not using actually civic tech to connect people and create new networks. So in terms of this kind of uh, um, situation where each network has a own purpose and there is not a real uh, collaboration and connection between different networks, sometimes even the most uh, open uh, public administration, for instance, is using civic tech just to get people involved in some general idea, but they are not connecting uh, people by people each other and allowing them to create new networks. So I'm really interested in how we really uh, could be further and not just uh, creating some kind of niche uh, different little groups or networks and each of us is uh, developing some innovative uh, approach and we are really happy between us and we are changing the world but at the end we are not really connected and we are not able to change and have a real impact on the on the ground and on the on the city so um, how how we can we could avoid that how we could avoid to be just in our own network I, I, I would take an example, I think, from Mexico City. So in, I, I'm not necessarily convinced that it is the role of government or public administrations to create the networks between people. I think you can create, a, you know, facilitate frameworks or create a, a certain um, space for that. But I, I think that there, there certainly is a role for public administrations to answer problems and uh, seek participatory methods or engagement using technology. So in the case of Mexico City, there's the Laboratorio para la Ciudad, um, which is part of city government. And the question there was around Uber and Uber's integration into the city and what that should look like and what the policy questions were there in terms of whether it should be integrated and what the, what the structure of that should look like. So I think that the engagement in a technical sense or in the, in the civic tech sense was you know, to engage citizens and to get questions and to actually solve problems. But I don't necessarily think that this, the intention or the structure was necessarily then therefore built for um, participation or new networks to form you certainly could, but it wasn't that role. But I think that the infrastructure was formed in terms of a city of 23 million people to then understand and take in input and to iterate and improve upon that process for understanding policy questions. I would remember that there is empty chair here. If some of you want to join us, please. You have other reaction or... Um, yeah, I, another 
Yeah, I could introduce other, other subjects. I'm also interested in um, urban pedagogy and uh, how actually, because uh, naturally we were um, seeing this, uh, uh, this slide with the centralized, decentralized and distributed network. And there is a problem, I think, uh, because actually naturally each of us is not familiar with this kind of um, scheme. Uh, we don't know exactly what is uh, a network. And I feel there is a lack of uh, learning about that. And in a way, I think as well that uh, as citizens, uh, we don't know exactly what is the territory and what is the power we have as a citizens on the territory. And my, my guess is that as networks, uh, at each level, we could have more power to be real uh, a protagonist on our territories. So what is uh, the learning uh, curve, the learning process we could uh, promote uh, as actually actors already connected uh, as a networks? I think I agree. Um, so when you when you say like as as a as a group a group we can do more. Um, I definitely see that in in the C100 network where we bring together people from around the world. So that's more a global community rather than a local. Um, but they're they bringing those change makers for. Are they sitting in corporates or in governments, bringing those together and sharing ideas and strengthening that each other in like this is this is important and that these are good ideas and actually then starting to collaborate? Um, I think that's a very that's ma what makes networks very strong. Um, I think there's also a lot of networks that are based on on just dialogue. So as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, monoculture happening caused by uh, digital communities, so people meet and just discuss whatever they agree, they meet with whoever they agree with um, without really challenging each other. Um, so there we create monoculture and in, instead of engaging with, with the range of different actors that we should engage with to actually create real solutions. Samantha, you have something to say? Um, yeah, so uh, I would, of course, refer again to the educational system. Um, and uh, what, we're gonna, what we're doing with our program as well is, if we look at young kids, take them out and uh, let them get to know their community and um, have them create challenges together to uh, be, be part of the design of uh, the urban context around them, but also getting to know how local networks uh, work and, and what is needed to participate in, in local networks, whether it's digital or offline. So I think what we see is that there's little uh, room for innovation in our educational system, but it's something we really need, keep, keep need to look at on how we can adapt um, our, our, that, that system to really engage kids from an early age on in civic processes, which is not done at the moment. Um, and on another other level, of course, learning never stops. So also in, uh, in, in organizations itself, we can implement also uh, sharing, uh, sharing principles in the sense that peer-to-peer -peer learning should be actually integrated in organizations and government bodies as well. In my experience, often uh, if I've worked with governments, then on, a, for example, the city of Amsterdam on a central level, they have developed a vision and a strategy or doing pilot projects, but on a local neighborhood level, the local administrator doesn't have any idea that this is going on in their own city. So I think within organizations and government structures, there's a lot of learning still to be done. Um, yeah. Thanks. We have uh, finally someone. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Joanna. I'm from CivicWise, as Domenico. 
and I'm from Barcelona. Yeah. So when I heard this question, in fact, about impact, I, I would say that um, the impact is, it will depend on the actions we can do, on the proposals we can develop, on the projects we can do. And this um, capacity of doing projects, doing actions, is also a matter of power. So for me, the, well, more than an answer, I have a new question is um, do uh, networks um, have an impact because they manage to um, get a kind of power freedom because they are very legitimate? Do they have a, um, are they at the same level sometimes at local governments or local like city governments? Is, there, is it a matter of um, force, like, do, is it clear what I say? No. So <laughs> I will take it another way around. Um, we, we have a lot of communities that have initiative and then they have some uh, debate about some subjects, for example, environmental subjects, whatever, and they get to very pertinent answers, very um, they, they know the reality where they act, so they have good answers. And uh, do they, like, in order to make their ideas possible, in order to um, apply their solution, is it a matter of negotiation with the local government? Negotiation, like, um, are we thinking about the power of the network or is just, it happens spontaneously? Is there uh, something that would happen naturally? Or, yeah, maybe it's not that clear. You are, to, you are talking about how each uh, citizen could collaborate with the local government, something like that, having the initiative. Uh, yes, uh, something like that. So through the network, uh, how each citizen is proactive and is producing some action. I, my, the way I would think about these networks, and I think that the, the point is that what, it, from our perspective, we're, we're interested in resilience and urban planning and some innovation in the way cities are do, do business, right? So from that stance, you have these um, larger overarching goals that you're trying to implement. And you have, I think that there's power in numbers and there's also a willingness to take on new initiatives and new ways of doing things given these networks. And so you're, you're pushing forward and you're giving certain legitimacy to being able to do something, right? So as you push that forward in terms of innovation in process, innovation in project design, et cetera, your negotiation, from my perspective, is in part with government, right? Because you're partially, you have other, uh, you know, Uber structures where, be it, um, you know, the SDG goals or the, um, or other overarching priorities in terms of how a city is to do business. And then you have, you have that pushing forward and you're saying, okay, as a network, we're pushing for innovation. We are change makers. And then the negotiation at some point, if you have a more um, stodgy government, you're also saying, okay, well, we're negotiating with you because we are consistent with certain networks and certain ways of innovating and pushing forward and therefore you're negotiating. And I think that the you know, the other part of that too, though, is also monies, right? I think that there's, uh, in, in this conversation, there, I feel like there's two levels, right? You're, you have networks that are um, creating value, but a lot of times that can be associated with money and pushing those networks forward and who gets a voice in terms of those networks. And then another level of it is citizen participation. And those aren't always, those don't always coincide. So I think that the, you know, something to also be cognizant of in terms of these networks is uh, when you want to push participatory processes involve the, the citizens when we also see these other actors which are institutions um, you know working with uh, private sector etc you are also pushing forward other agendas and so I think that both of those end up in from my perspective you know negotiating with local government or or larger government structures I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> So, see if someone wants to join. Hi, my name is Amanda. I'm connector for Netherlands of We Share. Um, I actually think we are creating new panopticons with our distributed web networks. So, this is actually a new phase of 
meta con uh, considering our networks as they are at the moment and not you know going back into the difference of distributed networks and governments which are not distributed and then how they negotiate but it's a new entirely new governance structure that we're talking about how to deal with uh, uh, different distributed networks that are becoming panopticums how are holes and parts connected are holes and parts of of, of these different networks how do they relate do they have conflicts or actually are they agreeing or what's the different you know um, dynamics in this and we cannot just return to how to learn to share we have to learn to deal with these different dynamics I think some reaction yeah um Again, I think I'm going to go back again. I'm sorry to be the party pooper, but um, winter is coming. So, um, you know, it sounds very good, but the fundamentally networks are not good because they are networks. As I say, they are, we are trapped into an amazing complex system of networks that we don't see them, and it's not important for us to see them because they need to operate with their own purpose, and they're very good doing that. And part of that optimization is actually why we're sitting here and we are thinking about probably a different reality that is actually outside. And again, sorry to be the, the, pessimist or the, or the pessimistic of the party pooper. And then at the same time, I have to say like a, one of the purposes of having a network of cities or a network of communities or people is to lobby, basically. If you look at it at the very uh, pragmatic sense, you are lobbying. You're creating a group of people that is able to create a common voice in order to be a force that can somehow participate in, uh, you know, in a moving economy, in a moving world that actually is acting with their own forces. No? And in order to play in that game, uh, again, I think that we need to leave somehow behind the sense of you know, natural naiveness that, that comes when we talk about networks, communities, um, you know, that we are doing good and they're doing bad, us and the citizens. So, uh, you know, there is a level of pragmatism that we are missing uh, while the reality is happening somehow. So we're talking about an idealization of what we, how we see things to happen, and probably I make it happen in the 15% you know, of my time every day, but at the end, the other 85% of your time, I insist, you are trapped in other networks. So I want to challenge. This is my reaction. I have a reaction and a question. Um, so, first of all, as you said, that n these formal networks, so for example, cities network or multi-stakeholder network, they are made to, their core purpose is to lobby. I would say I'm, I'm very strongly disagree, or that's like core function of what they do. Sorry? Yeah. So, but I, I, yeah, so to have a voice, but I think very much what, what we do in the foundation is very much about action and not talking. So, that's very much about yeah, people need to meet and talk, and talk, but for the core purpose is actually to implement and create. And I think that's very different. That is creating indirect influence, but I would say that's very different from lobbying. Um, then a, a question. So as you say, the problem is network, but also being part of informal network. I'm just curious how, like, so say we're, so when we are blind, like taking a, a flying somewhere, we are part of a value chain or a network. So that's what I would call an informal network, while cities, like these like formal network or institutions are formal networks. So how, how do we act without being part of a network? Um, I don't really, I just don't understand that. To, to explain to you, that they are formalized networks, they're not informal. They exist, they are constituted, they're companies. Airbus is a network of companies. IKEA is a network of companies, and you work with them from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, I disagree on something else, but I'm going to be polite. Uh, and I, I'm going, uh, I want to say that I, I'm not saying that we, we, we create, a, again, get out of the naiveness that we become a lobby to fight against the powers. No, we work at show. We work with IKEA. We work with, with whoever we have to work. And I, what I'm claiming is for pragmatism rather to this idealism of creating, you know, we are a network that is visible or more visible than the others. No, the others exist as well. But they have their own mission and they go for their mission and they do it. And their mission is not to justify that they exist as a network, it's to do their mission. So that's what I'm saying, like uh, somehow we, we are putting the value 
in the network, the values in the purpose of the network. And I think that's what the discussion is. But then I completely agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. I, I mean, also, for example, as you say, the purpose is not, I mean, the foundation is not set in the world to create networks or like run C100. Uh, and that's also why the, we, like, in the, like, around the cities, cities issue, we work with other networks like 100 Resilient Cities or the C40 and so on. So we constantly leverage instead of creating competitive small networks that try to, like, huddle in and make a room for themselves, it's, it's about actually creating change and action. Um, so I, I'm thinking now uh, that would be interesting talking about how networks could be uh, something that just uh, maybe solving some problem or maybe are promoting a new scenario. So I, I mean, in your point of view, maybe uh, what we are doing, in which sense you are working, creating a new scenario or solving a problem, because maybe it's really different. And uh, in this way, um, what, what is the, the transition time? See, is the network just a transition time? It's a second question. So, because maybe, as uh, Thomas said, we are maybe trapped in a lot of networks, and now the network is the, the answer, and uh, at the end, actually, we are just using the networks to achieve a new scenario, which is uh, really similar to the scenario we already had. I mean, of course, the, the C100 is not the end of the journey. It's a platform for collaborative governance, like in broad sense. So as long as that platform works and generates change at the right scale, then that's the format we work in. But we always reconsider and develop and innovate. So, of course, it's not... Uh, it's just the beginning rather than the end. Um, yeah, there's one topic I wanted to, to bring, uh, which may be a naive question, but how do you guys think we can make cities actually collaborate with each other? Because uh, we hear all the time, like, okay, the future of the United Nations, it, it will be the United Cities, and then cities who should uh, join forces, uh, especially in times like when Trump is, you know, is getting out of the Paris Agreement, so the American cities are coming together, and you are all working with network of cities. But, like, how do you, how do you make them actually make uh, joint investment, for instance, in common technologies, common infrastructure, common standard? Uh, like... While each of them have their own political cycles, their own local economy they want to develop, their own startups, their own companies, like what would be like a pragmatic approach to actually making them work together and making joint investment in an open infrastructure that everybody can build on top so we can go further? Joint inv investment. Sorry for my very bad French accent. So you mean joint investments among cities? Yeah, I mean, how do we make them work together to invest uh, in common, to in common tools, infrastructure, uh, solutions, so that everybody can reuse? To I, they, I mean, it's an interesting premise for me because it's not necessarily a value you would share per se. Like the intention isn't necessarily for them to make joint investments as cities. I think that the a lot of the questions and so the networks again what they're trying to achieve is this idea of how do you innovate in a space of better urban planning or planning for the future or making it human-centered development and how do you replicate those best practices and so I think that the um, the, the question in some ways is very simple right but very complicated in practice in terms of like how do you use technologies how do you use these different structures to then cre recreate these better practices and I think that um, you know, simply speaking, like a lot of the innovation has happened in other spheres in other cities, and for and the fact that it's challenging for certain cities that have never heard of of certain very um, you know basic concepts in terms of uh, being able to innovate on their on their infrastructure is like is a very basic challenge, but at the same time, just something that we're tackling at a very I would say again basic level. So I don't know necessarily. I mean, it's an interesting question in that we're not necessarily even trying to uh, tackle those in a joint. Joint fashion. Yeah, I mean, it 
can probably take the form for sure of replication, but also maybe uh, investment in our common standards or technology or, I mean, just an open question is, but it's like, how do we practically get them into actually working together, sharing knowledge and putting common uh, investment into yeah, new solutions? For instance, there is this uh, situation with the platform for participatory budget in Madrid, Barcelona, and a lot of cities in, in Spain, that they are starting now sharing a common uh, infrastructure. So maybe it's something that uh, could happen, more collaboration and not repeating all the time the, the same machine. Yeah, you see in practice that your, quen your question is, of course, already for uh, being answered because in a way it's, there's a need for it. So uh, currently you have the parliament of mayors, you have the sharing cities network, and there's yeah, different networks of cities coming together to exchange knowledge. Um, so I think uh, we're in that transition actually today as we speak. And as you say that there is now uh, in, in, uh, in Spain already a, a tech tool also to exchange that knowledge. I think we're, we're in the transition as we speak, yeah. I, I think that the, also like the, the, we're sitting in fundamentally, the, again, a massive wicked problem, no? Because there are these massive collaborations in terms of technology, like uh, internet standards, uh, communication standards for wireless communications, for instance, in the, your mobile phone, that happens at the national level. Yeah. So one of the things is the competences of cities, in which, uh, in which level of decision making they have on creating standards, and which type of standards they are directly responsible for. Because then you have this overlap of competences, not only at the national, but also even regional. No? So it's a kind of a the governance mess uh, that happens also in, in, in Barcelona, in a same territory space in the city, probably in a block, you have the overlap of the local government, the city council, the Diputación, the area metropolitana, the Generalitat, and the Spanish government, and the European Union. So you have all the stack of complexity that you have to deal with at different levels of bureaucracy. Then, in the other, I think the other hand, the other, the other cause of a wicked problem is the uh, transparency. I think both the, the financial transparency and also the intellectual property transparency, you know? and so which both actually are the fuel of the current competitive competitiveness of cities that probably has been seen better in the smart city model. No, that was based on who was going to be the, the ranking of the first smart cities in the world, who is investing more money into wireless communications so in the public space, who is investing more on security and whatever, blah blah blah, smart uh, stove lights and so on. And you start to see a race, no? And that's responding to a competitive uh, paradigm. So the collaborative paradigm cannot sit on top of a uh, old infrastructure and with that lack of transparency. So you need to have like a very clear and transparent set of rules and, and ways of sharing what you're in order to live, you know, from the from the surface. Which for me is kind of a, the we only see the, the sharing surface, uh, which is kind of a, the the crispy bacon part, no? but we need to go to the, to, to, the, to the bottom, no? to the meat, and that's where the basic infrastructure is needed. And I think what's interesting is that while you have this race, then that's when you had um, big global marketplaces and services that took over the entire world, like Airbnb and Uber, and then cities were pretty late to react, saying, okay, how should we regulate or manage this transformation? And if you think of things like autonomous vehicles in the future, like should the standards and protocols and communication and the way they will behave be completely owned by a few companies or should cities like join together to agree, okay, what should be the right way for these to, to impact our cities? Uh, what, we, what impact will it have on, uh, on the tax we collect on parking spots, for instance, and, uh, and on traffic and all of that? And that's when I, when I mean when I mean like common investment into like common protocol and standards. I don't know if it's, it's maybe naive, but I'm thinking maybe we can learn from the previous digital disruption to anticipate the next one and how cities could uh, like be a common force to actually anticipate that. If some, someone else wants to join, I have another question. Um, what, what's up if uh, instead of technology we are sharing uh, alternative currency by cities? So image, I don't know, we can figure it out several cities create a new currency, and we can use this currency just in these cities. 
uh, what about it? And it's also a, a, a toss about basic income, actually. Uh, what I mean is we are, all of us, creating some kind of um, wellness, uh, welfare um, locally, and uh, sometimes financial structure is giving away the value we are creating locally. And uh, if we start to think in a network way, maybe we have more power as a city to get locally the, the value we are creating. What do you think? Yeah, I can react. So uh, <laughs> I think that, again, uh, the question is why you would like to create an, uh, I, I, and I would say like a, 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 instead of alternative currency, probably I, I've been thinking lately that probably makes more sense to talk about complementary currencies, meaning yeah, that yeah, complementary. You know, complementary uh, that's where I think oh, it becomes interesting. And I think, for instance, why and, and to think about in a scenario, put an example to take the question from another angle, no? which is. Uh, the issues, especially in cities like Amsterdam and the cities like Barcelona or, or other European cities with tourism, right? In which the tourists are uh, not considered citizens of the cities, no? Or in this kind of this tension between the, visita, the visitor and, well, Paris also, no? Like, a, you have seen like a fossilization of, a, of, a, of cities based on the touristic activity that actually it doesn't have sometimes it's not giving any return back to the city because that, you know, the exploitation of the touristic activity responds to you know, larger markets that actually extract the value from it. So I would say that you know, if you think about a potential application in which a network complementary currency would be interesting is to think about a type of uh, you know, circular economy, good, good citizen, tourist, uh, that can, yeah, can actually, give I, somehow something like that. No, no, no. I could argument better. Actually, the currency is a matter of trust. And I think uh, a network is as well something created with trust. So the thing is, uh, are we able to go further? And uh, it's a provocation, of course, this idea of uh, uh, complementary currency. So the idea is, for instance, C40. Uh, Why 40? Not more. Uh, what is the limits of our networks and uh, w where, where we are going? Um, C4 is more than 40 now, anyway. Yeah, I, I, but maybe I'll take a, a different approach, and I'm not really sure that this is where um, you're angling, but. Um, I mean, what I, I'm from the border, so I'm from the Arizona-Mexico border, uh, and I work with uh, Ciudad Juarez, which is in Mexico, and uh, El Paso, Texas, which is on the other side. And Ciudad Juarez had many years of violence, but was all, is also a huge manufacturing center for a lot of U.S. companies, right? And so a lot of the manufacturing gets done on the um, Mexican side, and then you have a lot a huge cargo going over to El Paso, and then distribution routes, um, thinking about Chicago and Detroit and different cities in the US. So when I think about networks in that sense, I mean, I imagine that what, what's, what is potentially, what can be created potentially in terms of value are direct networks between Detroit and Chicago and Ciudad Juarez. And really what's happening with the wall or what's happening with the declarations of President Trump are relevant, but maybe not as relevant if certain networks or certain um, economies are pushed to create value directly with these cities and directly creating direct economies within those within those different um, nexus points. So I think that the uh, I guess the my what fascinates me or in part worries me is um, who motivates those networks and what is the aim, right? So you're creating manufacturing for big companies and perhaps three cities are going to benefit uh, specifically and you're going to create certain currency for those three cities. But, um, and you'll be able to bypass or you have a lot of agility in terms of the networks you're creating to create manufactured goods or to create, uh, we'll call it value. Um, but I think that it's also a struggle because then these networks in some sense are co-opted by large uh, economic interests, right? And so, uh, I, you know, it just goes back to the point of what these networks are trying to create and what does value mean in, in that sphere. Yes, I'm really sorry, but uh, I'm informed that uh, the time is finished.
But I have good news because we could continue actually in the main terrace outside. So I, you are invited to following us uh, at the main terrace and we will continue the interesting uh, debate. So thanks a lot uh, so far for your contribution. Uh, see you outside.